overview of uh, the process that we need to go through for uh, inner healing and deliverance. Um, and understanding it's not a one-off um, event. Uh, inner healing, because remember, remember the onion with the layers, inner healing is a process. And, um, you know, God led Israel into the promised land and they had to take the promised land. There was uh, an enemy, the Canaanites were living in the land. And the Canaanites ruled the land uh, through uh, the various stronghold cities. There was kingdoms, not one kingdom of Canaanites, there was kingdoms of Canaanites. And, and they ruled every territory with these stronghold fortresses. And, and God led Israel uh, into the promised land. But God said to Moses before him, and he said, Moses, tell Joshua this. Because Joshua is going to lead the army into the promised land. He said, I'm not going to give you the whole land in one day. Mm. He says, I can't give you the whole land in one day. Because if I give you all the land in one day, the land will be empty and desolate. And it's going to be full of wild beasts. Mm. Wild beasts will take over the land. And, um, and so uh, you're going to be given the land stage by stage, step by step. And territory by territory. And... You know, in our lives, if we just got saved and then everything was clean and everything was dealt with and and we, we would be empty vacuums. Um, and in the space of the empty vacuum, again, Jesus spoke about deliverance. And, and we know wherever there is deep woundedness, even if a demon isn't in there, a demon can have control through that area of woundedness. Uh, they are access points or open doors. For the enemy to control us, and and if anything, um, when we're deeply bitter and hurt, uh, the enemy doesn't have to get into us. He just has to put the right pressure on us and make the right suggestion, and we often just follow the will of the enemy because of the hurt. And um, and so you know, I, I remember when I was in, in Asia, and uh, especially Southeast Asia where they have the water buffaloes. I don't know if you've ever seen a water buffalo, but um, you know, water buffaloes, they're these huge, big buffaloes, big, huge horns, and um, they often get them to tread out the rice paddies and uh, all these different things. And I saw this huge, big water buffalo, and uh, here is this little kind of Chinese, Asian chopstick man, you know, like... Uh, <laughs> Mr. Chopstick, really skinny, skinny arms, skinny legs. Um, didn't look like you'd eaten really good dinner. And uh, here comes this really skinny Asian guy to this huge water buffalo. And the water buffalo had this ring in its nose. And I used to think, why do they put that ring in its nose? It looks ugly, you know, like. And that this little skinny Chinese guy comes up to the ring in the nose of the buffalo, twists it around, and that water buffalo followed him everywhere he led it. Because the pressure point here twisted. And um, see, this is how Satan gets Christians to follow him. Mm. Is he puts the pressure into the the area of woundedness, the area of hurt that's not been healed, mm. uh, that area of the fear that you might have, the insecurity that you might have, the the deep doubts, and all of those deep doubts go back to wounds where you you don't trust God fully, and, and and so the enemy comes in, he puts pressure, and even where you're wounded, he puts the pressure on the wound, and it hurts. And then he gets you to react the ways he wants you to react. Because we react out of our hurt. We react out of our anger. We react out of our bitterness, out of our rejection. And this is how Satan uh, takes Christians captive to do his will. Um, so Jesus, speaking of deliverance, and he said, you know, when the spirit is cast out of a man, that spirit will seek a new house. Uh, seek a new person to control. And so that spirit will go through dry and empty places seeking a new house. And if it doesn't find a new house, then the, the spirit will come back to its original house, that original person that it dwelt with, and that spirit will, if it finds the man clean and empty, that's the vacuum. It's good to get cleaned up, but, you know, it says in Scripture, we put off the things of the flesh and we put on the things of the spirit. When we repent of ungodly actions... We need to intentionally and proactively now put on godly actions. And, mm. 
and you need to um, do the opposite and and you need to now seek the things of the kingdom of God and if you're just putting off the things of sin and you're repenting of things of this world and you're getting set free from demons but you're not actively filling yourself with the things of God and filling your time with pursuing the things of God there's a vacuum and so Jesus said that when the Spirit comes back and if he finds the house clean but empty, because you know, what are you going to do after you've been confessing and repenting and dealing with things during this intensive and you've been cleaning up house and demons have been losing authority and they've been leaving, um, not saying that you're possessed by a demon, demons can be on the outside just getting control on you through something in you, you know. But you know, here you are set free, what are you going to do next? Mm. How do you maintain your freedom? And, and um, and so Jesus said if that spirit finds the man clean but empty, it actually doesn't go straight back into the man. He goes off and he finds seven other <clears throat> demonic spirits more powerful than himself and more wicked than himself and he brings them back in. And, uh, and so the, the end result of this person is actually going to be worse than the beginning result. And it's one of the reasons why it says in Hebrews, uh, it was better to never have known... Uh, the salvation of Christ than to have known it and to reject it and walk away. Because, um, you know, I'm amazed. I've seen Christians walking with the Lord for years and then suddenly, because of hurts or wounds in church uh, or, or through relationships with other Christians, uh, disappointments with God, and what happens is they walk away from God, they walk away from the church. They don't just go back to being a non-believer. They go into really deep, dark sin. It's like that. They just. It's like now. There's nothing. I'm just going to go, and they actually get worse. Mm. Uh, a lot of Christians that backslide, they reject Christ. Mm. Worse than just a normal non-believer who's trying to be a good person. Mm. It's like when you reject Jesus, you know, I don't want to be a good person. Um, and just saying, there is this process. And so, what we do after the ministry is really important. Uh, the principle I talked about yesterday: make sure you don't feed the flesh. Make sure you feed the spirit. Uh, with the things of the Spirit, like worship and meditating on the Word of God and, and then applying what you're learning in the Word of God. And I heard one man say, if we focus all of our time and energy as Christians on doing the do-dos, we won't have time and energy to do the don't-dos. Mm. And in other words, when God has commanded us, you know, go and pray, go and worship, um, encourage one another, um, Go, go and share the gospel with non-believers. Uh, you know, go and uh, give to the poor and, and, and focus on uh, being someone that would comfort those that are mourning. If you're focusing on doing all the things that God says to do, at the end of the day, you've you had no spare time to run around doing the don't do's, you know. Uh, the things that God says, don't commit adultery and, and, and don't get drunk and... And uh, right. all of those sort of things, it's like you, your time is full right. of the, the, the doing the do's of God, yeah. which means your spirit is being fed uh, through obedience. And, and, um, and so this is a really important principle because a lot of people do go through a lot of uh, inner healing and deliverance and they notice a season where they're doing well and then all the problems start coming back. And, and they go, well, what, didn't I get delivered? You know, didn't the demon come out? Didn't I get healed? Um, it didn't work. And you hear them coming back, oh, it didn't work. You know, I'm, I'm just as bad as I used to be. And, and well, the advice that Jesus gave uh, on a number of occasions, for example, the woman caught in adultery, and, and you know, um, the, the, the accusers left because Jesus said those who are without sin cast the first stone. And, and all the Pharisees, it says, starting with the oldest ones to the youngest, because the youngest ones are more self-righteous and all caught up with how awesome and wonderful they are as religious people. But the older ones have been around a long time enough to have a bit of humility. And it says, from the oldest to the youngest, they left. Because they realized there was no one there that was truly without sin. Uh, and, uh, but then Jesus turned to the woman, you know, and where are your accusers? Well, they've gone, there's none left. And he says, I don't accuse you either. You're forgiven. But go and sin no more. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, there are things that we do to cause our woundedness. Yeah. There are sins that we sin. There are attitudes, wrong attitudes are sin. You know, pride is sin. And, um, and, and uh, it even says in James chapter 5, 
if we would confess our sin one to another, we'd be healed. Isn't that interesting? Healing coming from the confession of sin because the reality is a lot of woundedness and hurt in our lives comes because we've sinned in some way. And when you think about unforgiveness as being a sin, because Jesus said forgive, and if we don't forgive, we're disobeying Jesus. So unforgiveness is a sin. Don't be anxious when we give in to anxiety. That's sinning. Because Jesus said don't be. <laughs> um, and just uh, want us to think about this. And so the thing is, uh, there's a man with a really bad sickness, and uh, he tried to get it healed. He'd gone to uh, doctors and many different places to try and get his healing. It never happened. And finally it came to Jesus. Jesus healed him. There's a miracle. There was just, it wasn't a huge process of healing. He just, boom, miracle healing. You're healed now. And, uh, but then Jesus said to him, go and sin no more. Let something worse come upon you. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so this is, this is something is maintaining the freedom and the deliverance that we've got. It's not that it didn't work, it's maybe that you have gone back and started giving in to the un ungodly lifestyle of negative thinking. And I want to deal with negative thinking because negative thinking where we're meditating upon and speaking the lies of the enemy and, and meditating upon and speaking ungodly things, that is sin. That is sin. Sin isn't just getting drunk and committing adultery. Sin is things like having wrong attitudes and, and constantly meditating on the wrong thing and speaking out the wrong thing because words have power. God created the universe by speaking and we can actually sp speak woundedness into our own lives. We can speak ourselves into sickness and bondage. Um, but we can also speak life into ourselves if we learn how to agree with the truths of the Word of God. And, um, and so we need to look at what happens after but God will lead us through the journey step by step, dealing with issue by issue. We couldn't handle it all at once. And, uh, and that's why I encourage people, if you want the fullness of healing or the fullness of deliverance, don't just go to one, but uh, go to a series of seminars on inner healing. Um, read books on the subject of deliverance and inner healing. Um, you know, go, go on to YouTube and there's some, like Jack Frost, I'll give you the name. Jack Frost has got some very good teaching on YouTube. He's with the Lord now, but the good thing about uh, modern technology is even though he's with the Lord, we can still listen to him, you know. And um, but he's got a lot on the Father heart and everything. So if you want to reap a harvest, you sow seed according to that harvest, amen? Mm -hmm. So if you want watermelons, you go out and you plant a lot of watermelon seed everywhere and you water it and you fertilize it. And you hope some of those things are going to come up, you know. And, and if it's good soil and, and it's good seed um, and you look after it, you're going to get lots of watermelons, you know. You don't plant watermelon seeds and wait for the apples to come. They won't come, you know. And the thing is that if you want to reap the harvest of healing in your life, start to sow the seed. Um, start to, to read books about that subject and look at, uh, listen to audio tapes, uh, you can get online and listen to this whole intensive again. We're going to have it on YouTube. And, um, and so you sow those seeds and, and go to people that know about it and, and know about biblical counseling and, and just talk to them and get them to speak into your life. Because when they speak, they're speaking the seed into your life. Uh, but make sure you water the seed, make sure you look after the seed and you nurture it until you get the harvest. So these are um, important principles to consider. The first step that we saw is we need to start to understand, and, and we've gone through um, not everything, we've just gone through, I suppose, a general overview of the characteristics of woundedness in a person's life. And if we wanted to, there's a lot more. Um, we'd probably be here a long time. But the, the first step is becoming aware of the issue of in, um, woundedness, uh, the, the issue of the need for healing. And start to uh, identify what are the characteristics of woundedness. And so then you start to look at yourself and say, you know what? Uh, a lot of the things I'm struggling with in life, these negative emotions, um, these addictions that I can't break, uh, these um, a constant cycle of failure that I go through and I'm not 
you know, I, I don't see a cycle of success. It's like um, there's a lot of people have they have what they call a boom bust cycle. They see success and then all of the success is stolen because then boom, everything they lose everything and. That's almost worse than never having success, you know. Mm -hmm. um, they have success and they lose it all. And But see, the first step is identifying the characteristics of woundedness mm -hmm. and the characteristics of the curse and, and then being able to look at yourself and it takes humility and honesty. And Jesus said the truth will set you free. And it's a truth about yourself. To be really open and honest with yourself um, because we've learned to, you know, the suppressant thing, you know, you can imagine someone with the, the deep, intense pain uh, where they're dying of cancer and they're getting all these stomach cramps and everything. And so they take the morphine that suppresses the pain and uh, they never actually deal with the cancer. And, and if you identify cancer early enough in the whole process, um, then the doctors can do something about it. You know, there's some pretty radical things they've got to do, but... If you can identify cancer early in the process, then there's a lot that they can do. Um, but if you're going through all the pain and you're just ignoring it, and I heard the story about this man, and um, this man was getting at night time these very constant stomach cramps. And there's something about men and doctors, you know, like I don't know what it is. Um, women seem to like run into the doctor quite regularly. But there's a thing about men and doctors, and men just, you know, like, Oh, it's all right. It's just a stomach cramp, and you know, and he's going through these stomach cramps for years. He never goes to the doctor, and and then he starts pooping blood, you know, and and he's still going. Oh, it's just a one-off sort of thing, and um, then he starts pooping a lot of blood over a period of time, and finally he goes to the doctor, and he's got advanced cancer, and his intestines and everything. There's cancer there, and they said if you'd only come earlier, we could have really done something about this. Um, but he kept putting it off, and so the problem got worse and worse. And so that's why we want to look at our lives and start identifying these issues. Yeah. And if, even if it's not, um, even if you're only at level three of the pain of this issue, you know, deal with it at level three, so that ten years later you're not dealing with a level eight. You know, like th these things, unless you deal with them, do intensify in your life. And so a lot of medication that people end up getting is a suppressant. It doesn't deal with the root of the problem, it's just pushing it down. And then what happens is while they're on that medication or that treatment, they feel good, they stop that medication and then suddenly, because the root's there, it all just flares up again. And, um, and so we, we, we need to identify the roots, and it, but it takes incredible humility and honesty with ourselves because one of the suppressants that we've been taught to use it's a, in humanistic thinking is, um, I'm okay. And, and, we're, and, and, and we're, we're told that if we tell ourselves we're okay enough, we'll believe that we're okay. Mm -hmm. Now, yes, there, I believe in positive confession. I believe in agreeing with the Word of God and confessing things over ourselves. There's a truth in that. But, you know, if a man's got cancer, he can confess till the cows come home that he's doing great. And he's still going to die of cancer. Um, the thing is, you, the, 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 the truth will set you free. And if you're not okay you need to say you're not okay. Mm -hmm. um, and this is where the faith ministry, if you're familiar with an extreme of faith ministry in the church, it actually encourages Christians into denial. Mm -hmm. Remember, denial is a river in Egypt where God's people are kept in bondage. Denial, you know? And so faith, a lot of the faith ministry, positive confession stuff, is they're actually denying the reality that they have a problem. And so, you know, how can Jesus heal you if you never admit that you need healing? You know, like seriously. Um, how can the doctors help you out, you know, if you don't go there and say, look, I'm going through some pain which is not normal in my life. Um, so, the, the, but we need that humility. We need to humble ourselves. We need to look at ourselves in the mirror. Um, that's uh, this first step that's really needed uh, to identify things. The second step is the acknowledgement of it. Once you recognize these things are there, I've got to acknowledge. Because how can you confess your sins one to another? How can you confess the issue to God if you haven't acknowledged it? And, and it's like um, there's, there's just the ownership that, that I have a responsibility to deal with this issue. Uh, so you need to acknowledge um, your need for healing, your need for help.
And, and again, especially for men, men don't want to acknowledge their weakness. And so men, uh, they, they put on the front that they're strong. I'm okay. How are you going today? You know, they're falling apart, they're depressed, they didn't sleep like that. How are you going today? I'm awesome, thank you. You know, you should be right. How are you going? Man, punch you in the shoulder. I'm going good. How are you going? Punch you in the shoulder too. Men do this a lot, you know. Women kind of just, ah, fall apart, you know. The problem is that they, the problem is they keep falling apart, you know, two years later they're still telling everybody how they're falling apart. They never dealt with it. So women have to learn how to deal with it. Confessing and sharing, that's not a problem for women. Uh, but the problem is as they confess and share, they're actually breathing life into the problem. Um, because remember, you create with words, you're actually magnifying the problem, you're feeding the problem, and there actually is a really sicko thing that happens with people. Um, and this can happen, it's one of the traits with women, but with men as well, not as big with men. But deep down, they're seeking people's attention. They want people to pay attention to them, and they want people to love them. And so, as long as they're hurt and they're wounded and they've got problems, People are paying attention to them. Mm. And so then they learn by remaining in that place of neediness mm. that people are paying attention and listening to them and hugging them and caring for them. Mm. And, uh, and so then they actually find their identity in a need and they don't want to get healed. Mm. And th there's, a, there's a true story, uh, just to give you a picture of this. There was a man who was uh, a cripple and uh, couldn't walk and... Um, if I remember the story correctly, that um, he got sick or something happened in life where he lost the use of his legs. He used to have the use of his legs, but now he's in a wheelchair and he's going around in the wheelchair and um, he's on uh, disability benefits from the government because he can't work with the disability. And 